Yeah, so my name is Mark Coleman. I am originally from England, now living in Sausalito, coastal Miwok land. And I have been <clears throat> studying Buddhist meditation for quite a while, since the 80s, and have been teaching uh, meditation primarily in the Buddhist tradition and the Insight uh, Vipassana tradition for 20, 25 years. And, um, uh, but my particular passion and love is to uh, teach um, uh, in nature, to teach the body of work that's called Awake in the Wild. That, that term came as I was writing my book in 2005. And um, yeah, for the last 20 years or so, I've been leading uh, nature-based meditation, mindfulness-based retreats. Uh, and all kinds of beautiful settings. I think a few of you have been on some of them. In fact, I know some of you have been on them. Um, and um, yeah, they're very profound. That's a very beautiful way to be in nature. It's a very um, supportive place to meditate. Um, I was just on a webinar this morning showing about this work and um, showing about how um, much more accessible uh, meditation is for so many people being outside. <clears throat> and so having taught these retreats for 15 years or so, I realized that there was only one of me and lots of people who wanted to find out about them. So decided to start um, uh, offering these teacher trainings. So this teacher training starting in December will be my fifth uh, nature teacher training. I, I also run mindfulness teacher trainings uh, through my organization, Mindfulness Training Institute, and I'll be teaching one of those in September. That'll be the 10th one we've done. And um, yeah, the, the, the Awake in the Wild teacher trainings are, are probably my favorite thing that I do in, in the year. <clears throat> uh, it's always an amazing group of people because the training draws both meditators, but people who are nature lovers. And there's something about people who are nature lovers, forgive my bias, but they just seem to be very wonderful, juicy, alive, connected, warm human beings. Um, I think that just nature brings that out in us. And, um, and so those are the cohorts of these incredibly rich learning communities that end up becoming very deep, um, containers and um, develop lifelong friendships. Um, it's incredible how deep the connections happen uh, on those year-long programs. And so so how the training works, so it's a year-long and um, <clears throat> the, the, the bulk of the training is delivered through four week-long immersive nature meditation retreats. And I try to vary the retreat settings to include as much different ecologies as I can, depending on weather and climate and um, fires, which is now a much bigger concern and challenge with, with finding venues. Um, so the first week long uh, retreat happens in uh, Baja, California. Uh, Mexico, um, in this wonderful wilderness center just north of Cabo. Um, very different than the Cabo, you know, that's on the beach with the margaritas and all of that. This, this is a very quiet wilderness center, very beautiful, amazing, lush, tropical, not tropical, but almost beautiful ficus tamarind trees and pools and springs and um, and so the, that first retreat is, is really a deep immersion into the practices, into these the body of awake and the wild practices. And, and, you know, there's probably a core group of about 20 to 30 practices. There's 40 in the book. Um, there's actually many more than that. In fact, I'm just finished writing a new uh, nature meditation book, Field Guide to Nature Meditation, which has 52 practices in. Um, but in terms of the training, in terms of the body of work, um, there's sort of a core body of about 20 practices that you'll be learning to cultivate, develop, practice, teach. And um, so I'll be mostly guiding the practices and giving you a very deep first-hand experience of those um, in a beautiful setting. And then towards the end of that retreat, I start, I start unpacking some of those practices and doing a little debrief about them. 
Um, and then the second and the third and the fourth retreat. So the second retreat is in, I believe, in March. Third retreat in July. I may be getting my months mixed up. And then the fourth is in October. Um, the second one will be in Northern California in a beautiful, uh, it's a private uh, ranch, um, beautiful forest um, near Auburn in the foothills, Sierra foothills, uh, about two plus hours from the Bay Area. And um, it's beautiful to be there in spring. I just led a retreat there last month. Uh, and so the second retreat, I'll be grounding you in the sort of foundational mindfulness practices as um, as we practice them outside. So I should have asked, but this is probably going to be obvious, but um, um, how many of you, well, I know most of you, a lot of you, uh, how many of you have a regular meditation practice? Let's raise your hand. Okay. Regular-ish. And how many of you is that mindfulness-based to some degree? Okay. All right. Um, so, so yeah, so the second retreat where we're exploring different foundational mindfulness practices like awareness of breath and body and sensation and sound, awareness of seeing, awareness of, um, you know, tracking our mental, emotional experience, but very different than how we might practice that in, indoors when we, when we go outdoors and we're sitting and say mindful breathing. It's a very different experience when you're in the forest, when you're breathing in fresh air released from grasses and oxygen released from trees and having a very immediate um, uh, experience of, you know, the scent of the, the ocean or the, the quality of the air and the light. And so each of these foundational mindfulness practices that you might have done in other settings, mostly indoors, take on a very different texture and flavor. So for example, mindfulness of body indoors, well, there's a certain amount of inner stimulation sensation that comes. When we're outdoors, right, there's a whole field of experience. Our body is this doorway to sensory experience. So we're much more aware of touch, of breeze on the skin, of the scent in the air, of the movement of light and warmth and coolness and uh, a whole host of other sensory experiences so that so the the practice becomes much more alive much more sensory much more juicy and in some ways much easier um, and one of the reasons why i teach outside and guide other people to teach outside is because in contrast to being indoors where mostly what takes our attention is our head and our thoughts and our worries when we're outside because we're our animal nature wakes up, our sense of nature wakes up, we become more attuned, more engaged, more stimulated, more allured and responsive to the environment. And so in that way, grounding in the present becomes much easier and also more rich, more juicy, more embodied, and also more satisfying, more pleasurable. And so we'll explore a variety of those practices on the second retreat. And in the second retreat, you will begin... Uh, the, really, the, I think that the heart of the training, which is learning how to practice teaching meditation. So in using groups of three, you'll be learning to guide each other. So I'll introduce a practice, which will be mostly familiar, like breathing, sensing, hearing. I'll um, guide that meditation. And then you, in turn, will practice guiding based on your own experience. Uh, of how you practice mindful breathing, mindful sensing, etc. And so that may sound intimidating, um, and it is in the beginning for some of you, if you're not used to teaching or teaching meditation. But it very quickly, um, the reason I start early is because the more we teach, the more we practice, the more we find comfort and ease and fluency in that process, then it just becomes easier. And you will also find that you learn a tremendous amount from each other. I always say that you learn as much from your cohort as from me. You also learn as much from nature, if not much more from nature than from me. Um, but um, it, and this is where it becomes a very lovely collaborative learning experience because we're teaching each other. Um, 
and so we'll be guiding each other in those practices and those foundational mindfulness practices in retreat two in week, week three no, retreat three uh in june um we'll be um exploring more the sensory dimensions of practice um, different ways that we have more interactivity with nature we'll be exploring some movement practices um, some heart practices um, and and then in the fourth retreat um, we'll be exploring more some of the insight reflective uh, practices where we can really learn to have some profound understandings about our interconnection, our sense of place in the web of life, a sense of meeting the, the, the wisdom of nature, its teachings on impermanence and transience and ephemerality and things. Um, so all through the second and third and fourth retreat, there'll be a lot of both learning practices, learning to teach those practices. Um, and then of course, I'll be sharing throughout the, the retreats, the retreat two, three, and four, um, a lot about what it means to teach in nature. There's, um, just some curious, how many, how many of you uh, have taught in some way, if you're a teacher of something? Okay. Some of you, and how many of you have taught meditation in some form or other? Okay. A few of you. Great. Great. So, um, so there's a lot to um understand and learn about teaching in nature it's fun i just got off a zoom call with some colleagues my dharma teacher colleagues of mine at spirit rock and we we're running a nature retreat at spirit rock and two out of the four teachers haven't taught a nature retreat they've experienced meditation teachers and insight meditation teachers and i was just aware that there was so much that i had to sh uh, share with them and onboard them about what it means to be outside and and how um, spontaneous you need to be and responsive to the conditions and how there's all kinds of considerations that you might not think about had you not practiced outside and and then taught outside so so i'll go into a lot of both logistical things about how to set up an event and how to run it and logistics and gear and and, and all of that, um, but also, um, you know, working with the group and working with different levels of ability and, 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 and issues of inclusivity and how we make this accessible to everybody. And um, so and I'll be exploring things like ethics and working with the climate crisis um, and um, yeah, so, so there are a lot of issues around the teaching, aside from just teaching meditation, how to work with students and deal with questions and projection and transference and all the other, a lot of the stuff that goes around, goes on around the teaching uh, field. So, um, yeah, so it's a very rich journey. And then, so that there's so the four retreats over the year, and then in between the retreats, there's a few different things. One is you'll be assigned a small pod, usually about four people, sometimes five, usually geographically based. So hopefully some of you can actually meet in person and you will meet with your pod minimum once a month. A lot of the pods meet twice a month because they love just being with each other. And um, part of the reason for the pod is for two things. One is to check in. How are you doing? How's the practices going? How's the course going? Two, the beginning and the end of each pod meeting uh, somebody will guide a meditation. So you get to practice teaching the practices, practice teaching the practices that you are doing yourself. So there's a very important commitment to your own practice and to taking your practice outdoors. So you're actually, because my, all my teacher trainings, the basis of them is that you're learning to teach from your own experience. You're not teaching from a manual. You're not teaching from a book. You're teaching from your own experience because that's really where the wisdom comes from, which means, of course, you have to practice because <laughs> there has to there has to be something within you that you've learned and developed over time, and of course that grows over time. Um, so um, yeah, so but there's a lot of practice opportunities for teaching all through. So one of those is your pods. You meet once or twice a month. Um, you'll also have a 
I call him a Dharma buddy, but it's a, it's a, you know, it's a buddy that you meet with at least once a month. Again, some people do twice a month or once a week. And that's a more of a personal check-in, just someone that you that tracks you through the course um, and that you can share and check in with. Um, the other purpose of the pod is to explore the readings. You'll have a couple of book reading, a couple of books per semester, per in between each retreat, there'll be two book uh, reading assignments, um, mostly based around nature, nature contemplation, um, and um, so one, one about climate, one about one mindful of race, Ruth King, um, um, and different books that explore different dimensions of the practice. Um, and then there'll be some assignments. The assignments are relatively, um, I would say, low key. This isn't an academic program. This is an experiential program. So um, the f after the first retreat, you'll be asked to write an essay about what, what nature meditation practice means to you, your experience of it, your journey with it, your understanding of it, as a way of learning how to talk about this to other people. After the second retreat, you'll be asked to submit a video, uh, a, a 10, minute, 10 to 15 minute video of you teaching meditation to your cat, to a friend, to a plant, to whoever it is will listen to you. Um, and um, cats are very challenging. I've got two of them and they're, <laughs> they're very, they don't sit still very often, my don't. Um, and then after the retreat three, you'll be asked to um, submit a talk so part of the uh, later on in the, in the program I, you, I'll give some instructions about how to talk about the practice and, and give mini talks and I, I don't really like using the word talks because we have a lot of stuff about talks and lectures and this isn't a, you know a professor in a university you're basically introducing different aspects of practice different dimensions for five to ten minutes so I'll ask you to, to submit a recording of that um, as if you were just sharing a friend, talking to a friend about meditation, you know, a 10 minute introduction to meditation. It's not, not a big deal. Um, I mean, it might be a big deal to some of you, but it's not really a big deal, um, except what your mind makes of it. Um, and then, um, you will be assigned a mentor. A mentor is a graduate from the previous trainings, um, who will, um, you review your material, the, the essay, the meditation, the talk. Um, and then also your practicum uh, um, assignments. So in the practicum, which happens between module three and module four, you will be asked to do lead a, a day long uh, nature meditation practice um, or two half day meditation retreats, practice periods, whatever you call them, um, that you will record some elements of those and also submit that and uh, have students come and there'd be, there'd be an evaluation. Um, so that's sort of the, the main sort of nuts and bolts of the land. There's the four retreats, there's the pod group, there's the, um, the meeting with a mentor, there's the uh, one assignment between each retreat. And then I will also, also be offering monthly tutorials where I meet with the group and share some teaching. Um, often teaching that I don't have time to do on the retreats and also time for questions and check in, see how you're all doing. Um, and so that's the basic lay of the land. Um, and um, yeah, so it's a, it's a very rich, immersive experience. You will definitely deepen your own meditation practice. You will deepen your own understanding of what it means to meditate, to bring mindful awareness outside. Um, and you will learn how to share these very simple, beautiful, accessible practices. Um, and you will create and you will co-create and be part of an amazing cohort. Every single cohort that I've had, you know, the five have been these incredibly rich, juicy, fun, alive, engaging, deep friendship forming, uh, groups. Um, and um, especially the, the deep, deepen with the pods. Um, and um, yeah, so, so that's a rich part of the learning. Um, 
maybe I'll pause that because that was a bit of a fire hose. So, um, and then just see if there's uh, questions, questions about the training, question about, questions about anything really, questions for me. Um, yeah, so you can write them, you can just unmute yourself and um, come on to the screen and we can chat. So please, questions. I have a question, Mark, or a few questions. One is about about how many people uh, usually are in each cohort. Um, and then could you say, did you say there was a mentorship component? I'm not sure I, I mm -hmm. got all of those details. Yeah. So thanks, Jenny. Nice to see you. Jenny and I, we were, we were just on retreat together. I was teaching down Esalen last weekend. It was very nice and big, sir. Um, there, so I cap it at 20. And I find that to be a nice size. Um, mostly the groups end up being sort of in the high teens, and sometimes 20, 18, 19. The last group was smaller because of the pandemic. It just was crazy to <laughs> plan anything. So the last cohort was, I think was 14, which is also a great size. Um, so I don't know what size this will be. Um, I'm imagining somewhere around 14, 15 would probably be um, given just the interest I'm sensing. And um, and then the mentor process is so, so each of you will be assigned a mentor and a mentor is someone who's graduated from the program previous years. And um, it's, it's kind of a light mentorship. It's not like they're tracking you every step of the way, but you're, they're definitely tracking your um, assignments. So when you uh, write your essay, the essay goes to your mentor, and then you will meet with your mentor about the essay, but also about how you're doing on the course and questions. And, and then after the second retreat, you'll submit your meditation video. And again, that goes to your mentor, they'll review it, you'll have a meeting with them, they'll talk about it in any way they can support you and any, anything that might support your growth as a teacher. And then, and then, and then there's a couple of more meetings after that. So, yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yes. Hi, China. Oh, uh -huh. Lupe is bringing a cat. You have got a very similar cat, Lupe. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a question. I think the thing that impresses me most about med this, this might seem silly, but meditation teachers is that they've read so much um you know buddhist literature and so they can quote they can say that scriptures say this the, you know the buddha had this story of what happened to him the right i mean can you just talk about how much of that is really needed to be mm -hmm. a teacher yeah yeah great well um so yeah um so my obviously my background is buddhist trained as is yours and um uh, so i'm so the te the practice is very much drawing on that lineage particularly the mindfulness lineage um and um but the the way that i've sort of formulated awake in the wild teachings is um you know i would say it's um Buddhism is it, Buddha, the Buddhist teachings are the foundation, but not necessarily the the overt expression. So, so when I'm teaching, I'm not using a lot of Buddhist lingo for the most part. I'm not quoting the suttas, the, the texts, um, but I am teaching about mindfulness and I'm teaching insights that can come from the practice. Um, and so, this training isn't a Buddhist training. I'm not expecting you to be a Buddhist teacher. That's a whole different kind of training. But you, you, you are going to draw on your own practice and your own study. And if that is Buddhism or mindfulness, of course, you're going to draw on that. But there's a no way expectation that you're going to be a Buddhist teacher or a Dharma teacher, but you are teaching nature based meditation practices. So uh, hopefully that relieves some pressure or anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Mark, how are you? Hi, good. Nice to meet you. Uh, uh, good to see you again. Um, actually, um, I, you probably don't recognize me. I've, um, oh, yes. No, I do. Sorry. Yes, yes. And, uh, 
um, by yeah, no. and then yes, um, yes. most recently up in uh, the, the bay. Um, so right. I'm a fan. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so my question, though, is about um, uh, so I have a great practice during my time with you in retreat and um, just after. <laughs> and then it sort of falls off, um, uh -huh. not by not from lack of wanting, but just from, you know, the busyness of the world and work. And so I did read in the um, sort of the requirements that um, you'd like your students to have at least two years of, you know, good meditation practice. So um, I'm on to learn about it and wondering, you know, if you have suggestions about um, what I might what I might do to get that practice and then potentially be eligible for the next retreat. Um, so I, I don't think that uh, my practice is a, in a place that I guess would, would make me eligible for this time around. Um, but I'm wondering what I might do to prepare or to get myself ready for potentially being in the next cohort. Yeah. Yeah. How long have you been meditating, Lisa? Uh, goodness. So probably uh, my first retreat was with you in Vaisitos was when I first was exposed. And I think that was in 2014. Uh -huh. So well, off and on since then. So, you know, six years off and on, sometimes regular and sometimes just, you know, completely not on it. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that, that you're definitely eligible. I think the criteria is only two or three years of meditation and, and one or two retreats. So you're definitely eligible this time around to oh, okay. apply. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I was and, thinking more two years consistent and I was just, uh, you know, thinking, yeah. well, consistent. OK. <laughs> <laughs> well, consistent is a, it, yeah, consistent is a subjective uh, 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 term. Um, yeah, no, I definitely, I know you and I know your practice, so I definitely say you're welcome to apply. Um, and, um, so, so given that, what was the, what was the question? There was another question or. Uh, no, oh, I oh, guess, so how, uh, how to support, how to I, support. Eligible, your because I was thinking that I probably was not eligible just based on my intermittent practice over the years. Um, right. and I was coming on to say, you know, what could I do to prepare to be eligible for the next cohort? So, right, uh, right. you know, if I am eligible, then that's good to know. And I will just continue to, to listen and, and consider signing on and or applying. Yeah. Yeah. And I would just say, you know, um, uh, um, you know, obviously the more you practice, the better. And so between now and when they when the training starts, you, um, you know, do as much practice as you can be as regular as you can, which, you know, and that's the, probably one of the hardest things for most people, um, is, is a regular practice. It's just, it's just how it goes. Um, so, um, yeah. So finding support for that, you know, attending groups, um, and in particular, taking your practice outside. I mean, you, you've done a couple of nature retreats, so you, you know, you clearly like that practice. So the more you do that, the more you're preparing yourself. It's the best tr training, best preparation you can do is to just take, you know, commit to your practice as much as you can and take your practice outside. Um, whether that's a formal practice of sitting, but it also might be walking and hiking and camping and might just, you know, Taking and I take my laptop and I sit on my balcony or in my garden or I go up to the headlands and I like I just try to be outside as much as possible because it has its influence. So that's all supporting your practice, right? So yeah, no, so feel, feel free to apply, Lisa. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks. <clears throat> yes. Uh, other questions, please. Questions, concerns. Oh, oh, Christy, do you have your hand raised? Here we go. Hi. Hi. Um, so um, I, I know you are, the way I've seen you teach uh, over the years, you're very, you, you sound and kind of give the sense of like a whole integration of nature into well-being as a whole. It's like not just meditation wise but the support that nature brings us mm -hmm. um and the question specifically for the training is kind of taking that into account i'm curious um do you address in a way the kind of the mental health in itself 
um, again, I've heard you many times addressing anxiety and you know internal experiences and being very candid and open about the real process of it. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, is that something that you know? Again, we kind of address in the in the group in the, in the mm -hmm. training in itself. Yeah, I mean, I think both. I'm getting some echo. But do you mind turning your? Um, yeah, I'm going. You doing? I think we'll we'll get less feedback. Thanks. Um, I think both directly and indirectly. Um, directly in that, for sure, these practices are a tremendous support for well-being, and. Um, profound uh, antidote of, if that's the right word, for anxiety and stress and um, um, yeah, all kinds of mental health challenges that partly come from indoor living, from too much screen time, from being separated from nature and the elements and, and the wider web of life. Um, and, then, and, and then indirectly, yeah, I think the there's a kind of an implicit way that we're speaking to how this is sort of, you know, essential for well-being as part of our human nature. And um, so, you know, and of course, depending on who you teach and where you teach, you might speak about that more explicitly, you know, in terms of a mental health context to a mental health population. I have graduates who teach in um, hospitals and mental health clinics and to uh, recovery groups and to um, you know stressed out teens and so there's definitely a um, um, you know a place and an important role really for how these practices can be both you know, explicit and implicitly supporting of, of well-being. Um, so, does that answer your question? Yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm biased, of course, in a positive way, but there is a link there. And, um, and I also heard you talk about a little bit the um, teaching, the training into the dynamics of the group, the transference or quantum transference. So, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious and excited to see that you, you, you've integrated that in the training in itself. I think mm -hmm. it's just allowing, um, better teaching, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah well, it's part of, part of the field of teaching and, um, you know, there's a lot of richness and complexity when we get a group of people together <laughs> and group dynamics and you know and power and transference and projection and um you know and the importance of you know ethical integrity and inclusivity and being sensitive to different experiences and um so yeah so but no i think these i think what i like and what i like about these practices is they are you know and as you probably know the doctors uh, prescribing time in nature now in South Korea and Scotland and New Zealand and Japan and other places because it's like, you know, it's, a, it's like a great antidepressant, right? It doesn't necessarily replace pharmaceuticals, although it can in some cases, but um, yeah, it's tremendously important uh, for our well-being as we become an indoor species and kids become you know, less outdoors and so, um, yeah, so in that way, it's very rich. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Christy. Good to see you. Uh, China's writing, there's a woman, at Dr. Kaiser, recommending that, right? Yes, I've, I've um, actually seen her speak. Um, or maybe it's her or this, uh, no, there's another well-known uh, physician in, in San Francisco who's yeah, prescribing nature practice in Golden Gate Park. Yeah. So, Mark. Please. Hi. So I, I'm completely unfamiliar with your work, so I apologize for that. I actually Great. found out about this on a, uh, it was Corey Muscara had posted something on his Instagram. Okay. 
And I saw it pop up and I was like, I'm, I'm good for nature. I'm good for mind, mindfulness. I want to check this out. So appreciate you holding this. Sure. Um, I'm curious to, if you could talk about um, how people are leveraging this teacher training uh, hmm. once they're done. So the different, different ways that people do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Thanks, Grady. Yeah. So very, you know, it, it, it's quite a, quite a sweep. Um, so it often, people tend to take it into their either their domain of work or their domain of interest so for example like i have a, a friend colleague who did one of the early trainings she lives in, on ontario and she integrates it with because it's cold up there a lot of the year with snowshoeing and cross-country skiing and you know winter-based practices um someone who's a was sort of semi-professional rower and that she takes it to that community. Um, there's a graduate in um, uh, Denmark who um, is uh, both also an MBSR, mindfulness based stress reduction teacher, works in hospitals and she's actually doing her PhD on the efficacy of teaching that in the hospital garden. Um, so, um, and then people, there's Blanca who's integrating it with businesses in Paris uh, and executives um, and, um, you know, and then just people running uh, a colleague friend here who's um, uh, teaching it. She, she has monthly um, day long programs with nonprofit leaders in the Bay Area, um, integrating it with, to, with particularly with women leaders. Um, so it's, it just so sort of like it's, it often depends on whatever niche you're in. So if you're an activist, you are probably likely to take it back with you to sharing with your activist friends and, and colleagues. And, um, or if you're a coach, you'll maybe integrate it into coaching, um, or into your psychotherapy practice. Um, and so, you know, I've had about 50 and then with this current cohort, about 65 people go through the course. And um, it's really quite a diverse range. Um, there's a local woman here, Nikki, who's got a surf school and she does a lot of integrating of uh, surfing and mindfulness and nature. And she just does hikes on Mount Tam and Natasha, who also lives in Sausalito. She, she actually used the, she was one of the first people to do it through the Airbnb experiences. And even right through the training, she was, you know, doing, t taking groups out three, four times a week hiking, uh, nature days on Mount Tam, if, you, if you're familiar with the Bay Area. Um, and so uh, what's nice about the, the, this field, um, as opposed to the mindfulness field, so the mindfulness field, which has been sort of mushrooming in the last 15 years, but particularly the last five or 10 years. And, it, and now there's, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of mindfulness teachers, uh, which is great, the more the merrier but there's very few nature-based meditation teachers. Um, and so I, and from my opinion, it is, it's a wide open field. Um, and with the pandemic, there's been a huge surge of interest in nature with increasing stress levels, huge interest in nature as a resource, um, with the climate crisis and, and people realizing what we're losing more interest in nature. I mean, I live in, you know, next to many parks, national parks, and during the pandemic, you couldn't get near them for parking traffic jams. And so there's a, there's a deep hunger. And so I think this, and I, and I care passionately about this work, that there's a deep hunger for people wanting to be in nature, but like with like people who might want to meditate, but don't know how to do it. We have sort of lost the art of how to be present. And we, and a lot of people don't know how to make use of their time in nature. So what do they do? They're on their phones, they're taking photos of it and they're doing selfies and, and, you know, great that they're outside, but the research shows that when you use this in nature, it diminishes all the positive impact. So I, and, and then people do, a, do nature a lot, right? I'm going to hike it. I'm going to get my best time. I'm going to, you know, kill it on the mountain. I'm going to, you know, and, and don't actually bring a very you know, presence full attention. And so, so what I love about these practices is we're actually teaching people 
very simple skills of how to incredibly optimize this profound experience. Um, so, yeah, so many ways, Grady, that, that people have gone on to do it. Yeah, yeah. So I should say, I noticed people are jumping off. So um, I don't know how long all of you have, but if you are interested, um, reach out to Jen, who's the administrator, or just send in an application. You can go online to either my, my site, markholman.org or awakenthewild.com and just fill in the form online. If you have questions, you can send them um, to me and I'll just put my email in the chat here, or you can send them to Jen, the administrator, if it's more of an administrative question. Um, so there's my email. Um, and yeah, but I'm, 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 I'm here for more questions. So if, if anybody has something they, they want to ask about, please, please jump in. I have another question. I'm curious about the difference between um, going through this training and then becoming a certified Awake in the Wild facilitator, which seems more like an apprenticeship program. Is that right? So what's sort of the difference between the two? Yeah, well, um, so there's my literature has probably not updated itself to where the program is. but. Um, so so going through the training and completing the training successfully with all the assignments etc you graduate and you become a certified teacher and and then you maintain that certification by maintaining annual sort of basic um standards of practice like that it would be common in in the mindfulness certification um which would be to um you know to make sure you're doing a retreat a year, you're keeping a daily practice, um, you're keeping up whatever um, other professional, you know, whether it's liability insurance or um, or supervision, um, you know, just so you're 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 staying on your game basically. Um, so the apprenticeship program, um, which is what I originally envisaged for people who wanted to go deeper to become retreat teachers. Um, that sort of, um, where that is, um, that is, is in process. I, or the best way of saying it. Um, I do have a, a longer training in mind for people who want to lead. So this training equips you to teach classes, courses, half days, day longs, and a weekend, um, but not longer than a weekend. Um, um, time time frames i'm sorry yeah so sorry a class so a class a course a half day a day long um and if you have i would say um you know the skill you know ideally psychological uh capacity to deal with um what may come up you know, people going through difficulty psychologically then i'd say a weekend um or if you're team teaching, I, I, my retreats are silent meditation retreats and they require a whole different level and depth of training and practice experience, particularly because of the, because of the psychological depth and stuff and, 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 and spiritual stuff that comes up is, is, is can be intense. And so I am looking to do a, a sort of a level two training, um, that won't start for a couple of years because I've got, I'm involved in another training, training actually already fully fledged um, Dharma teachers to do nature work. Um, but it's in my sight to want to, 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 to take that deeper for those. And it's, and it's a small pool of people who have the experience and the depth of practice and the interest to want to lead longer programs. And that will be probably and a multi-year multi program. Could it, okay, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, for the teaching the longer, when you're saying, you know, we wouldn't be sort of equipped to teach a longer than a weekend retreat, what about integrating it into existing retreats that might be longer, say, a week or so, but that aren't fully silent meditation retreats but would be integrating the awake in the wild teaching strategies is that 
yeah. something we'd be allowed to do or to yes to do. definitely and, de and i actually yeah want to be encouraging of that you know like one of the things i was so another thing i haven't talked about is so the awaken the wild.com website that was revamped last you know revamped just when the pandemic hit which was really bad timing i redesigned it to be a platform for all the graduates to showcase their work offer their programs it was going to be a, it was a fully functioning registration calendar site um pandemic hit that programs went you know south and so it never really got off the ground although you can go on the wake in the wild website and you can look at all the graduates and programs they're offering um uh why am i saying that i lost my thread um so one and the I, originally it was going to be people were going to run their courses through that and be a full registration platform that got too complicated so we let people just ho host their events on there but to pay for them they go to an, their own their own websites the but my point around that was um um one of the things i was hoping was that people would like there's a graduate who leads pilgrimages in japan and when you start doing multi-day week long just like yoga teachers do they'll do a like i was just looking at some websites today yoga teachers leading a week long in puerto rico or costa rica or you know integrating yoga with surfing or yoga and you know ayurvedic practice in india or something like that and you know and 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 that becomes more supportive of livelihood you know if you can integrate these long you know or it's a mindfulness in nature as and as uh, lisa marie's doing uh in and pilgrimage in japan you know, like beautiful beautiful ways to integrate so yeah it can be a longer program as, as long as it's not silent it's the silence that that ups the intensity and requires a different skill set so by all means, yes, there's many ways you can integrate. Okay, I'm sure you, it sounds like you already are probably leading programs that you can weave this in very, very seamlessly. Um, and then, yeah, yeah, there's not, a, there's not a cap on that per se. Yeah. What, what do you, do you, Great, can you share, you. Do, you, do you mind sharing what you might be wanting to integrate it with? I, I don't know exactly what you do, Jenny, but. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I work yeah. with a lot of organizations around expanding equitable access to nature. So this oh, is right. very much the work that we do on connecting, you know, historically underrepresented groups with the outdoors. Fantastic. And, Fantastic. But it's often, you know, they're not silent retreats at all. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. But there's a lot of um, collaboration and coordination and networking and all of that that happens. Great. Beautiful. Well, I want to talk to you more about that. I mean, and one of the, my main aspirations for this work is how to make it more inclusive and equitable and accessible. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually in the process. I just hired someone um, who's in the process. We have about 12 different foundations we're looking at right now. I'm, I'm in the process of developing an, an Awaken the Wild nonprofit wing right now. It's an LLC um, to, mm -hmm. to attract funding. Um, specifically to fund, to diversify and like, you know, I would love to have, you know, a program of youth and youth at risk, um, you know, doing mm -hmm. these, taking youth out. It's not my skill set, but I know people have that skill set um, and to taking it to underserved communities. Um, I also want to work with um, environmental leaders, which I have done in the past and, and activists. Um, and hoping to secure funding and, and and open to any kinds of collaboration around that. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's really exciting. Yeah, I'd love to chat about that more. Great. 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 <laughs> Great. Yeah. Any others who haven't asked questions, Nicholas or Maho or please? Yeah. I have one. Hi, um, I have a question coming through. I see that there's like the, the early bird, you know, pricing uh, reduction in, in the application cost. I think it's the end of May. Yes. I'm curious um, just about the timing. I think you mentioned there was a cap, um, you know, on the training around 20 uh, people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, you know, I'm kind of at this transition period, you know, not that this would be my primary income, but um, you know, I'm just wondering if, if this 
this coming uh, session, the timing would be right for me. And so I'm just, I guess, wondering if you generally have an idea of, you know, how long the, the uh, enrollment will be open. Hmm. Yeah. Well, it's as open as long as it's, <laughs> as long as there's space. Um, and I, I can't say how quick or slow it will fill. Um, I'll know more after the early bird deadline because people tend to wait and apply and that sort of gives us a little sense of where we're going. Um, but th you know, there's time for sure. I don't, I don't want to create an, any unnecessary urgency or panic. Oh my God, I gotta, you know, apply tomorrow. Like, you know, there's time, there's space, listen to what feels right. I don't, you know, I want you to make the right decision for you at the right time. And, you know, for some people they know, and it's like, great, well, I'll get a little discount. Great. You know, put my application in and, and, but if that's not where you are, that's also fine. Um, you know, you can feel free to reach out to us and say, Hey, you know, I'm still not sure, but you know, if it really is filling up, I'm, I might, you know, put my, you know, <laughs> put my application in, um, for right now there's space. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Helpful. Yeah. Maho? Yes. Um, ah, hi. Hi. So uh, you talked about uh, practicum. Uh, is it going to be a real thing or is it just for the assignment? It's real. <laughs> we, what, what's that? Which means we have to uh, offer this real um, practicum, I mean, the practice yes. to others. Yes. Yes. Ah. Yes, ideally to, um, you know, to the public, but it might also be to people in your, your work or, you know, your particular, you know, maybe a particular community that you're like, oh, these would be wonderful people. They love nature already. They, they're already into gardening or they're into, you know, conservation work or the, you know, they're into meditation anyway. So the, the nature part is an easy add on. Um, so yeah, and ideally it's public, you know, of course, friends may come, family may come, but it's much easier if you don't know these people. <laughs> if it's all your friends, they'll just want to hang out. If it's your family, they'll have, you know, all kinds of <laughs> views and opinions. <laughs> so yeah, so, and it can be small. Um, I generally recommend like, you know, nice sizes like six to eight uh, people. And it can, it can vary people, you know, depending on where you are and what's happening and, you know, marketing and all of that. Um, so. Yeah, but it's, you know, it, it's a way for you to really, you know, it, it, it's good for it to be real because that's how we learn, right? We learn when we're in, we're in the fire and um, having to actually step into the teacher seat. So, and it's, and it's a beautiful, empowering thing to do. Uh, one more question is, um, I live in the city uh -huh. and um, is there any way um, I can integrate this? urban settings into this uh, living in uh, this nature. I mean, we have parks, but yeah, it's a nice different. parks. <laughs> which, which city do you live in? Manhattan. Manhattan. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I've got graduates. I've got how many? One, two, three, at least three uh, graduates from New York. Uh, and, um, one from Brooklyn, I think two are in Manhattan. Yeah. Um, and, um, and then one or two others sort of near there. Um, and they lead walks in, you know, in the parks and cemeteries and, you know, a little, you know, you know train ride out of town. Um, and, you know, I think people in the cities in some ways need it more. Some do it on rooftop gardens, um, or just on rooftops. Um, and, you know, I always say nature is everywhere, you know, and, um, uh, in the city, you know, nature is there, you know, it's, 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 it's between the buildings on fifth Avenue, you see sky and clouds and sunrise and sunset. And, you know, you go along the Hudson river and, you know, you get a little more space and, and movement and, and bird life. And so, um, definitely, I think it's, 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 it's valuable, if not invaluable to support people learning how to orient to nature. I've taught a lot of retreats in Central Park. Um, one of my students and graduates there, she, 
has different art community um, and so I've done a bunch of different day longs in uh, yeah different parts of the park um, so no I think it's a great place to, to, to take the practice you know and then you can also you know as you know it's you jump on a train you go up the Hudson River and you don't have to go very far and you have beautiful nature and then that's also you can include that too you know do these sort of outings <clears throat> Yeah, thanks, Maya. Lauren, did you have anything? Oh, you want? Sorry. oh, sorry. Sorry, Lisa, did you say, did you want to have a question? I do. I do. Thanks. I, um, I'm i curious to know out of your graduates, I think you said you have at least 50, um, are, are most of them being able to integrate it into sort of their, um, their business life? So I know some folks probably are taking the course just for their own personal development, but um, I would be thinking of using this to um, actually integrate it with um, equine coaching, um, sort of oh, yeah. small business idea that I have in mind. So, you know, horses and nature. And so um, it, are, are folks finding that they're able to um, integrate it? I mean, like you've got a successful, um, you know, uh, practice and business going. Are, are folks yeah. that are graduating finding that they're able to sort of start building the same in their lives or... Mm -hmm or not yeah yeah it depends you know it i think it depends i think i think the 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 um what's the word the market for one of a crass word the the opportunity is there for sure you know and and and, and so as i mentioned you know probably 10 or 12 people doing different things um i think many people who've wanted to have been able to successfully integrate it into their their passion or their their existing work their existing field of experience um so um so i'd say yes um, and especially if you already have a you know an established business or a thriving business then i think it's much easier to integrate that like for you with your equine business i have a friend who has similarly integrated it into equine or uh, equine work uh, as she's a vet um so yeah yeah no many examples of people doing that quite successfully yeah i'm actually sort of straddling both because i just uh, uh resigned from my 30-year career of being a social worker and um okay. have just become cert i mean have become certified in equus coaching recently have not applied it yet um uh -huh. so this is the time to start trying to build this sort of vision that i have so yeah i'm great. i'm straddling not just it's not going to be professional i don't already have something established um and it's more than personal um so kind of in the middle there so looking for that great, great. gray area yeah no i think it'd be a great uh thing to integrate yeah yeah thanks lauren did you have a question i do yeah i feel like a lot of people's questions have helped um, helped me and kind of answered a lot of things that I was curious about. Um, I'm a psychotherapist up in, in wow. Ontario, and wow, um, I can really picture being able to integrate this um, into my work with clients. <clears throat> and it sounds amazing. I guess what I'm left with is kind of a logistical question, um, you know, taking the time away from my clients um, that many That's times true. during the year. I, yeah. of course, would like to attend all of the in-person um, events, but also how far I am. You know, is there a certain requirement of how many days of, like, in total I have to be, or, or does it have to be the entire thing? Yeah, I mean, of course, I like people to be there for the entire thing, and, 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 and life happens. And um, um, so I, I'm, you know, flexible about people missing one of those retreats. Um, if, that was, if that was, like, a deal breaker, you know, I think you can... You could get away with missing one of them and, and then they're all I, I video record the, the entire thing video and audio record and then i just have people who miss for whatever reason you know a lot of people missed recently because of covid um they just have to commit to uh engaging in all the the, the practices the guiding meditations the inquiries the homework um, discussions they just have to you know find someone to do those practices with so so you so you're mm -hmm. kind of kept up to speed mm -hmm. yeah yeah that makes sense yeah and i i would still aim to attend all of them um sure. but yeah i was curious and uh, do you get any any participants from canada very often um i mean i know you mentioned a couple but, but yeah you know, pods you know i don't know if i would have any <laughs> 
Yeah, um, in the current training, there's uh, Amarin is from uh, she's from BC, from from uh, near Banff, and um, uh, yeah, I've had a, a bunch of people over the years, including and as I mentioned, this uh, my friend Kim up in uh, Ontario. Um, and I'm, I'm blanking on others, but I know there've been others. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. 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 Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Great. All right. Great. Please. Great. Uh, just logistics as well. Um, you mentioned, um, you mentioned California, uh, Baja and California and the other two, they're also on the West coast. Um, or middle of the country and again just logistics because I'm in the northeast other side <laughs> uh, okay so any planning planning mind. yeah so the third one is likely to be in New Mexico um, in uh, when is that June July um, and the fourth one is um, is, is is up in the air um, I've got multiple venue possibilities um, the, I'm just seeing how this year goes with the fires because the fires are very real with, you know, in the smoke and just, you know, I, I, I'm needing to go more coastal to, to get away from the smoke. Um, so, um, but I'm also thinking about one possibly in, in New, in, um, New Hampshire, a friend of mine has a center there. Um, so, and especially if there's more of you from the East coast or Northeast, um, uh, it sounds like, um, at least three of you, and if not more, um, then, um, that's also possible. Um, I'd like to include somewhere on the East coast and, and, um, I'm exploring with a friend who has a center in, I said, in New Hampshire, um, which would be, and actually, and that would be in October, which is a nice time to be there. It's sort of post. I, I, you know, I haven't done much on the East Coast, mostly because of the bugs. Bugs and meditation aren't a great, you know, combination. <laughs> so, um, and the weather's just more reliable, has been more reliable in, in the West. It's drier, you know, etc. cetera. Um, but that's becoming problematic now with the, with the droughts and the, the climate change. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Where are you based, Christy? You said New England? Um, Northeast, um, in a tiny triangle between Philadelphia and New York, Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. Okay. So it's Great. like literally in the middle, um, mm -hmm. okay. but, but good access to, to, to pretty much everything, you know, California here, there, um, sure. Sure. just the tiny Great. bit. Yeah. Do you know, Mark, about when you would decide about the location for the third and fourth retreat? when those locations would be announced uh soon i hope it's um um i can i'm, I'm just i'm going to be uh, testing out this new place in um july for this current it's, it's, it's the current current teacher training which is ending in july i'm going to be testing out a new place i planned to go to my friend's land he has a beautiful forty thousand acre ranch up in northern New Mexico, but if any of you have been following the the climate news, New Mexico is on fire, and his ranch sadly, um, a lot of it burnt. Um, so, which is tragic. So, so I moved to another friend's place um, on on the Bicitos River, um, which is beautiful and old ponderosa groves and. Um, so that most likely will be the third venue, which is in, I think, June, July, I forget exactly. And then, um, I am, yeah, looking into the, the fourth one being in, in, um, quite likely in, uh, New England, up in the Northeast, um, which will also make it a little fairer for the folks coming from the East and Northeast or in, from Ontario. Great, thanks. And so you think those will be confirmed sort of this summer, by the summer sometime? Yes, for sure, for sure, for sure. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Yeah, anything else, friends? Apologize if you've mentioned this already, but does the program complete at the fourth retreat? It does, yes. Yeah, good question. Yeah, yeah. So people, so you do your practicum between retreat three and retreat four, 
And if that's successful, then there's graduation. And if, and if sometimes people have to delay, then there's a graduation after that. But yes, at the fourth retreat in October, that's when the program wraps up. And then there's an alumni um, body, which as I mentioned, there's 50 some, now there will be 60 some uh, graduates. And um, uh, we meet, I'm having a retreat this year, a uh, weekend retreat for graduates where we get to explore both connection, community, and also practices. Um, it's a very lively alumni body. And then we also meet, they meet monthly. Uh, I, I meet with them every other month. They meet on their own every other month, um, do different things. Um, I've done different uh, other trainings. I did a six month training for graduates. Um, so deeper dimensions of, of, of nature practice. Um, so there's very much a, a, an alive um, a graduate cohort and, and, and that will grow as uh, with time, with more, you know, as I'm putting more energy into that. So, great. All right, well, I, if this is interesting, I hope you, if it's, if it's a good fit, please uh, think of applying and uh, it'd be great to have you involved.